Our Father in heaven, we are but dust of the earth. We are the product of your hands, the, the gifted ones uh, created in your own image for your honor and your glory, and we have fallen so short. I pray, O oh Lord, that in your great mercy you'll bless us, you'll redeem us, you'll restore us. This is the gospel. May it be fulfilled in each of us, and, and we in turn help you in fulfilling it in the lives of our neighbors. I pray in Christ's name for your blessing on this uh, discussion this morning. In Christ's name, amen. So thank you. So, uh, yeah, so as I say here, uh, you might find it interesting, I know I did, that uh, the term, the true witness, is only mentioned in two scriptures in the Bible, in Proverbs, uh, the term true witness, and in Revelation. But notice, and it's right on the screen, notice that Proverbs says a true witness. It's, so there's really only one scripture talking about the true witness. Interesting to me. And, and the reason I think that's uh, significant is that this is uh, God's instruction or speaking directly to us as the witness uh, and there in Revelation 3, 14 through oh, 19 or 20, we would normally say, anyway, the message of, to the church of Laodicea. So what I'm going to do is now, I'm going to basically share uh, my, uh, it's on the screen, and I don't intend to read it, but uh, that'll be good. You can see what uh, parts that I don't mention explicitly. But I want to share some thoughts with you to stimulate our thinking about this topic. I'll tell you right up front that this is one of the more startling conclusions that my personal Bible study has brought me to in my 40-some years as a Seventh-day Adventist. I wasn't raised Adventist. wasn't raised Christian. I was converted in my mid-20s. That alone is a miracle for a, uh, a white male to be converted to Christianity in their mid-20s. That's when you think you're indestructible and you're, you know, making your fortune in the world. And it was against my will. I, uh, I'm not going to go into my story, but I, it, I tried my best to avoid those Bible studies happening in my home. And I couldn't stop it, uh, thank God. But anyway, so... I've been a student of the Bible ever since uh, in the writings of Ellen White. But this topic I've been studying recently more intently because of my work as a medical evangelist. You know, I was a, a medicine was, a, I got to say this part. Do, do you need more of a pattern to no, see it? Um, just a quick question. Is it three pages back and front? It probably is because it was six pages. It was okay. six, yeah. That's all I yeah. need to know. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I uh, went back to school at 48. I was a freshman in medical school at Loma Linda. I'm not recommending you waiting that long, but, but you know, God's uh, timing, we're told, he knows no, neither haste nor delay. So... I'm convinced I was not ready before that. Um, I had had a career in, IT, in information technology. I worked for Blue Cross and Blue Shield for quite a long while, automating uh, business functions. So when I went back to school, it was because I had come to the conclusion that I wanted to be a full-time missionary like Paul. I mean, I'll never be like Paul. I don't know that anyone will. He was like a... a a unique uh, person in many ways. But of course, we all want to be like Christ. But my point was, Paul was the example of a supporting, self-supporting uh, missionary. And that was what I felt called to do. And as I've pursued that, especially since becoming a physician, well, I'm not a physician. People ask me, and I say, well, I'm an undoctor. I don't do anything hardly at all like doctors. But I am a licensed as a medical physician. 
I'm certified in preventive medicine and in lifestyle medicine, and some have called me the father of lifestyle medicine because it was my privilege to be the spark plug that started the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Um, I'm the lead author on the review book for that to get certified, so, so I guess I am deeply involved in lifestyle medicine. Uh, but after I realized that, well, and the reason I went into that, by the way, uh, so in 1990s, I went to the training with Dr. Charles Thomas. Some of you may have heard of him. He was, uh, ran the physical medicine department in Lott and did uh, when the Loma Linda still had hydrotherapy. Well, it wasn't called Loma Linda then. It was called the College of Medical Evangelists. And, uh, and when the university made a lot of changes in the 60s, anyway, he um, went out on his own and, and started a school of massage and hydrotherapy. And my wife and I wanted to take, so we took that training. And uh, so I, that led me to pursue more training. And eventually I, I decided that God was calling me to be a physician, licensed as a physician. But what I'm really in, and when the, uh, is a medical evangelist. I went to the College of Medical Evangelists to be a medical evangelist. It's kind of interesting because my personal experience there was that in asking uh, my teachers and mentors, you know, how do you become one? What, do you, what is it? How do we, where in the church do you work as a medical evangelist? I really didn't have any answers. It was, it was kind of surprising in a way. Uh, but anyhow, we really didn't know. We don't know how a medical evangelist works. Uh, I heard about how to be a missionary physician. You go to the mission field and work, and I knew about that already, uh, but that wasn't what I felt called to do. My, I felt the call was to do the work. This is the way we are to work the cities in particular. I love the country. I left the city years ago, even before I became a, uh, a physician. Uh, but the work is in the cities, frankly. I wish it wasn't, because I like being in the country. But um, I like doing God's will a lot more than what I like for myself. And uh, I say that with a certain amount of sadness, maybe, because, I mean, I, we own a place in the country. We have it rented out. Uh, some others are enjoying our country home while we are working as missionaries. We spent, my wife and I spent a year as missionaries in Silver Spring, Maryland. I know that doesn't, I mean, that's like at the, it's like at the center of the work, you know. And we got to know some wonderful leaders in the church. But we were there not working for the, ch uh, for the church leaders. We were working for the community in, in Silver Spring, helping the largest um, ABC st store at the time to uh, develop a lifestyle program for the community. We're now spending a year, we're in the middle of it, a year in Grand Rapids, the second largest city in Michigan, helping the uh, churches in District 4 to establish medical evangelism in the city of Grand Rapids. And our call, uh, as we understand it, is to work the city of Grand Rapids with medical evangelism. And I solicit your prayers. I certainly am praying myself that God will make it manifest. If this is his will, will he make it manifest to the leadership and to you and to everyone, this is the way. If it's the wrong way, teach us how to do it the right way. Uh, so if you, yes, you should have a handout there now that thank you, and thank you so much, ladies, for your help. Uh, and it's um, a total of six pages, but I think there's only three sheets because it's printed front to back. And the idea is that you can make notes on there if you would like to. I hope you will make a few because I, I, I'm, this is not an hour and a half long uh, talk I'm giving you. I'm, we're going to have a 30 minutes or so, and then we're going to have discussion for at least 45 is my plan. Anyway, so with that little bit of background, um, I am a medical evangelist. I'm learning more and more what that is. It was interesting. I've, I've enjoyed the presentations already, the two that we've heard here. Uh, and uh, Pastor Dr. Mike touched on a number of things that are very relevant to what I want to talk about. So let's go ahead and get into this, what I'm going to call uh, my 
my conclusions or assertions. So, would you agree it's widely recognized that the Adventist church is baptizing thousands uh, in a day, which uh, is uh, interesting because that was one of the statements in the Spirit of Prophecy. She says that the, soon, you know, the, the, we will be baptizing thousands. Well, we've been baptizing thousands a day for actually quite a while. But do you realize that if we baptized 10,000 in a day, we'd still be getting behind? I mean, we could baptize 100,000 in a day, we would be getting behind. In other words, the population is growing faster than, than we're baptizing. Uh, and so it, it's, I mean, I'm not saying, and please, I am a friend of the church. I am a, uh, I, the last thing I want to do is disparage God's work or his church. But he himself has told us that while the church is the apple of his eye, he also says as de defective and deficient as it is. So in the message of the true witness is not a praise, praising us. It's, it's caution. It's calling us to repentance. It's telling us that, and in one place Ellen White says, can a great, any greater delusion come upon a people than to think they are rich and increased with goods while they are wretched and naked and blind and so on? So, so we as a church, I'm not talking about individuals. Thank God we have some wonderfully strong, clear, straight, and true servants in the leadership and in the laity. Thank God. You know, like Isaiah was told, uh, no, I'm sorry, Elijah, there's 7,000 that have not bowed the knee. And so I believe there's many more than 7,000 in the Adventist church that have not bowed the knee. But we as a church are still, she says one place, the message of the true witness has not been half heeded. Anyway, so we're getting behind. Uh, and yet it's interesting, we profess, see there, we profess that as God's remnant people, we are prophesied to preach the everlasting gospel to the whole world, to usher in Christ's second coming, all the while teaching that Christ's second coming is imminent. So it, what we're doing is irrational. We're saying that we are going to preach the gospel to the whole world and Christ is going to come, but we're getting behind. And so our understanding is not, I believe, is it, it, logic says it's not correct. How can those two things be both uh, correct unless we're expecting and, and depending on some cataclysmic event that's going to accomplish this? And in a way, it probably will be a cataclysmic event because when the church, which is now leavened with its own backsliding, repents in sackcloth and ashes, the Lord will do for us what we need to become truly his servants. And he can work through us in a way we have not yet witnessed. So in spite of this obvious dichotomy between our profession and experience, do we not also widely speak and act as though we are waiting upon Christ? I don't know how many of my fellow church members that I speak with and the impression that I get is, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Uh, I mean, I've gotten to the point that I, uh, it, that's offensive to me, not in a personal way, but we are not waiting on Christ. And that attitude or that thought is destructive to our purpose and our calling. Christ is waiting on us. He's waiting on me, John Kelly. He's waiting on me to be in a relationship with him where he can safely pour out his spirit through me, on me, to the, my fellow human beings. And so when I see, and, what I, and I want you to understand, this is why this is, I told someone yesterday, I said this is the hardest presentation I think I've ever tried to give in my life. I don't know how to do it. I'm, I'm faulty. I'm broken. I, uh, only by God's grace can we, I communicate to you what he's shown me as I've studied about this topic. It's, the primary thing is I need repentance and, and uh, to come in line with God's counsel. And I will tell you, for whatever it's worth, I have just recently stepped forward to implement something that I can, I, I believe God has been urging me for years. And I, and I finally said, okay, I, I surrender. And you know, it's become easy. The first few days it was terrible. I was having a lot of trouble. So, um, and what my specific thing I'm talking about, there are others I'm sure that he's about to fix me with work. But anyway, as uh, eating light supper, 
Now, I always followed the, I followed the council. You know, I didn't have my big meal at supper, but I had a light meal. Well, I don't actually work in, a, in an occupation that needs that. Uh, like it says in the Spirit of Prophecy, some, some working men and others need a third meal of substance. Not me, I'm a, I'm a desk worker. Uh, but at any rate, uh, I've been already enjoying the blessings now for, what, three or four weeks that I've been uh, having nothing. I just don't eat after my second meal. And there's a lot of people that do that. And I'm not urging you, don't, don't, don't think that I'm trying to change your, your meal pattern. Whatever God has led you and is working for you, follow God, not me. But I'm just sharing at the very personal level here. I am, like all of us, an unfinished work. And, uh, but anyway, and I believe that as I put my effort in clear, I, I'm committed to doing what God is asking of me, that's what makes him able to use me as an instrument. And when I, when I feel sufficient, I'm in danger. So, anyway, proceeding with uh, some of these thoughts here. Uh, so anyhow, I said, I, I was reading this, we act as though we're waiting on Christ. Act as though any further delay is his doing and not ours. We have the present truth. We keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. What lack we Yet, we wonder. But Ellen G. White says that we are strangely like the Jews who claimed Abraham as their father, and that was their proof that they were, right, that they, they were saved, they were the chosen. But they were denying the very faith of Abraham that made him the chosen. There's so much that can be said, but I don't have time to go into that. What I want to do is stick to this point about the gospel and the message of the true witness. So let me hasten on to it. So um, is, is that kind of a profession and experience compatible with our professed understanding of prophecy? You know, it's clear to me that we as a church are not living the faith we profess. And I don't say that critically. That includes John Kelly. Uh, you know, it's been a real blessing to me and my wife to cut loose from, I mean, I don't know how exactly we continue to be financially viable. I don't have any regular income. I don't have any, uh, for whatever it's worth, I have never billed a patient for any of my medical services, ever. Uh, and uh, not saying that doctors are wrong who do. That don't, don't go there with, the, don't let the devil take the, your thoughts there. I'm not telling you what's wrong with others. But I'm just testifying that since I have been committed to helping local churches do medical evangelism, I haven't really um, had support from um, that work. I mean, it is that work, but God has been providing, but I mean, it's not for a fee. Um, and the reason, oops, the reason I bring that up uh -oh, is that, that um, we, I think we have spiritualized away a number of things that could be and should be understood literally, like Matthew 6.33. You know, if you read Matthew 6.33, it's not ethereal, it's tangible, it's specific. Look, this is what you shall eat, what you shall wear etc. It's, it's not some spiritual thing. It sounds very tangible. And I believe it is tangible. And I believe that as we get to the point in our faith walk that we can have, we will experience this. We will actually be provided for. What kind of a God do we serve that if I put my entire career into his work, he is not going to pay me? Not going to take, I mean, that would, that would be, so it's not, and yet, so many people, when I ask them and my fellow church members, can they do this or do that in the way of ministry? They're like, well, you know, I have to work. And it's like you should immediately understand, oh, yeah, that's right, you have to work. Well, yeah, you do have to work, but really you have to work for God or else you'll be lost. Now, I do know that those two things can blend. I mean, let's look at Daniel. Daniel was working for Nebuchadnezzar, working in the king's court, but he was working for God. So I, I'm not suggesting that you have to quit your job, whatever it might be. But what I am saying is that when we have the attitude 
that our means of support is our job, uh, that's not biblical. So, uh, so I say here, let me ask, is our profession and experience compatible with our professed understanding of prophecy? We are not living the faith we, pos we profess to possess. Does that not make us hypocrites? Could we have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof? Are you, told, are you aware that we are told? That, look at that second paragraph on this page I'm showing. Writing about this very passage in Eight Testimonies, Ellen White says, What stronger delusion can beguile the mind than the pre pretense that God accepts your works when in reality you are working out many things according to worldly policy and are sinning against Jehovah? A fascinating delusion that takes possession of minds when men who have once known the truth mistake the form of godliness for the spirit and power thereof. That's a quote from Timothy. You know, that's the way Paul was writing to Timothy. He said, of these, avoid these. You know, those who have a form of godliness and deny the power thereof. And she says that's what's the description of me and my church. By the way, my thought about what I'm doing or wanting to do this morning is Daniel 9. Not, uh, not any, that's, I mean, this, is, this study has put my heart um, on, I don't want to say it's broken my heart for my church. We are, I just wish we could have the experience where they got, found the book of the law and they read the book of the law and everybody was weeping and sad in their heart and they wanted, I mean, it somehow it just touched them. Remember this story? That's what we need, don't, don't you? I mean, this, that's what we need for our church. Anyway, and then it says, uh, God's unerring assessment, we are wretched and miserable, poor and blind and naked. You know, I wondered for a long time, I've been aware of this scripture for since probably my first year of Christianity, of Adventism. And I wondered, how, how is it that God's end time church, judgment time church, Daniel 8, 14 time church, you know, Revelation 14, 6 to 12 church, how can that church be considered by God I mean, what else could you add to this to make it worse? You know, wretched, poor, blind, naked. Uh, and yet, at the same time, we say that we are rich and increase of good. And I wondered about this for a long time. And recently, I was studying, and the Lord, I believe, helped me see something uh, sobering, but I can't get away from it as the truth. I asked a couple of my uh, spiritual mentors, you know, help me, am I, am I misinterpreting the scripture on this? And, and uh, they told me after the hearing it that they don't see any, anywhere I'm, I, I have misinterpreted scripture. So it's your turn to help me. And please do be taking some notes wherever you have questions or comments about some of the things we're, I'm saying. But anyway, so here's what I, I wondered. That's what specifically, okay? Uh, what specifically, hmm, I guess this isn't gonna show up on that screen. Uh, is it that we as a church are doing that makes us, you know, so hypocritical, have the form without the, the power? Are you asking the question now? Or are you no, I'm at, no, yes, I'm, a, I'm asking the question as part of my presentation. So you can make a note there, please. Yes, I, I, the reason is if, I think if I, we start the back and forth too soon, I, I know I won't get to finish sharing some of these thoughts. But of course, since you have a handout, that's all right. You can look at it later. Uh, but what I'm saying is that's what was in my head. I'm asking God, what specifically? You know, are you aware, for example, we're told that the only sins that can be forgiven are the sins that we specifically repent of and confess. I cannot say, Lord, please forgive me my sins. I mean, I can say that. But if I want forgiveness, I am told I must reflect, I must acknowledge specific sins and ask for those. And, and this is a mistake that I think we have uh, also failed to understand. Um, and in fact, when, I, when God makes me aware of a specific sin, 
I am instructed that I am to do all I can to make it right. And so when I say, Lord, please forgive me of my sins, that doesn't make any of them right. And so, anyway, in a similar way, so, I, this, I'm, so what I'm trying to explain to you is, that's why I'm like, okay, specifically, what do I, Lord, need to repent of? What do I need to make right? What do we as a church? And so, I go, I go on here and say, how is it we're denying the power of the gospel? And uh, the Spirit of Prophecy gives us some insight. Uh, here, you can see this quote. He was in himself health and strength. He imparted his life to the sick, the afflicted, those possessed of demons. He turned away none who came to receive his healing power. He knew that those who petitioned him for help had brought disease upon themselves, yet he did not refuse to heal them. And when virtue from Christ entered into these poor souls, they were convicted of sin, and many were healed of their spiritual disease as well as of their physical maladies. The gospel still possesses the same power, and why should we not, in this I'm quoting her, should we not today witness the same results? And then a little, I skip a little bit, so I close the quote and start another quote. He is just as willing to heal the sick now as when he was personally on earth. Christ's servants are his representatives, the channels for his working. That's you and me. He desires through us to exercise his healing power. That's from Desire of Ages 823. And then it goes on. There were places where Christ, the Savior, could not do many mighty works because of their unbelief. So now, unbelief separates the church from her divine helper. Her hold upon eternal realities is weak. By her lack of faith, God is disappointed and robbed of his glory. So what I, as I've studied this, uh, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of things that one could could quote and so on. You can't do all that in a short period of time. There was a lot more than these. I chose these as illustrations. But what the Lord convicted me of, and I'm, I'm a physician working as a medical evangelist. I am teaching church teams how to do uh, basically lifestyle medicine combined with uh, Adventist natural remedies, okay? So we're using uh, what would, in the world, would be now recognized as lifestyle medicine which is the use of lifestyle change to treat and reverse disease. We're using that plus God's simple remedies, and we're asking for miracles. I believe that we as Christians are selling ourselves in God short when we don't seek and ask for a miracle for those we minister to. I mean, if you can give me one reason, and I'm not asking you to do that now when we discuss, but if you could give me one reason not to ask for a miracle, I would like to hear it. I've thought about it hard and never been able to come up with one that would, that would stand the test of, of investigation. She goes on and says, uh, uh, well, in my hand out here, what glory we may wonder, okay? Because it says God is disappointed, robbed of his glory. What glory, we might wonder. What was the source of Christ's glory? If you've never thought about that, think about it with me. What was Christ's glory? Was it not the miraculous works, I quote there, he did that testified of his divinity? Notice this text in John 14, 11. He says, this is Christ speaking. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. What is, that? What is he saying there? What works? He's talking about the works that indicate that he is uh, one with the Father. He's the, he is the promised Messiah. He's the, the Son of God, not just only the Son of Man. And then Nicodemus, and then in quoting here, John, came by, to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. So my assertion is and belief is that the glory is talking about the miracles that Christ wants to work. He, do you, you know, this has been an amazement to me. And I'll tell you a little bit about the personal experience it's given me in my spiritual walk. But to come to realize that God wants to work miracles through me. Yeah, I feel so unworthy. I feel so, well, and also there's a certain sense where like, I'm a little like Jonah. I'm like, well, I'm going to, ask you to work a miracle and it's not going to happen and I'm going to look like a quack. I'm, you know, I'm going to look like a... Uh, and maybe you, those thoughts would never occur to you. I don't know. But they did to me. And, uh, <laughs> and so I realized, well, that's 
I, in that very thought, I'm putting myself ahead of my patient and ahead of God. I'm worried more about me than about my patient. And uh, so I was rather quickly convicted that that was wrong. I don't want to go there. I want God to take that concern away from me. And so I ask, you know, it's like God gives us a blank check. Uh, in many ways, it's like that. And, and we are afraid to put too many zeros on it. I mean, well, zeros behind the number. In other words, we don't want to ask for too much. Have you ever heard that interesting story about the missionary told us? <laughs> You've probably all heard this, but it's, I, I still think it's a beautiful lesson. Anyway, the guy's uh, missionary is over uh, in a foreign land where the people are poor, and he's driving the, the truck down to the town to get supplies, and there's a guy walking along, and he's got one of those big baskets on his head full of stuff he's taking to market. So he stops, asks him if you'd like a ride, and he says, oh, that'd be wonderful. And so the fellow gets in the, sits in the back of the truck, and they're driving along, and the guy notices in the mirror that he's still got the, his thing on his head. And, he's, and so he says, hey, you know, you, could, you, put your, you don't have to have, you can put that down on the truck. And the guy says, oh, no, he says, it's so wonderful. You gave me a ride. How could I ask you to carry my burden, too? So, uh, but are we not like that oft times with God? <laughs> I could ask you to do a miracle for me. I'm not worthy. By the way, remember that quote? The nearer we come to Christ, the closer we come to Christ, the more sinful we appear in our own eyes. You will never, I will never feel worthy. And if I do, I, I need to take, I need to get back in the closet. Uh, but I will never feel worthy. So just, you know, what they, how they say it, deal with it. <laughs> that's the way it's going to be. Uh, so let's move down to the next one. The way in which Christ worked was to preach the word and to relieve suffering by miraculous works of healing. But I am instructed that we cannot now work in this way. Okay, now wait a minute. So this sounds like uh, that we can't work miracles and, and do uh, preaching. But for Satan will exercise his power by working miracles. God's servants today could not work by means of miracles because spurious works of healing claiming to be divine will be wrought. You do understand, right, that when, if and when that were to happen, there would be great confusion, which is, of course, what Satan wants to do. In other words, if God and Satan, you couldn't tell any difference in the, in the work, uh, who's God and who's working for Satan, there would be tremendous confusion. And it would be unreasonable, actually, for expecting finite human beings to be able to know the difference when there's no difference. So God makes a difference. And if there's any question in your mind about that, think about Job. Uh, the story of Job, and, you know, Satan's argument was, well, haven't you put a hedge around him? You know, let me at him. He's serving you out of selfishness, and I'll show it to you. Okay, so anyways, but this is the really exciting uh, part for me is the next paragraph. For this reason, God has marked out a way in which his people are to carry forward a work of physical healing combined with the teaching of the word. Brothers and sisters, you know, put, put your notes. We can discuss this, but it's gonna, it, my assertion is that we as a church ha, are uncomfortable asking for miracles. Well, I mean, it says right here that we're not going to, though. I mean, you're confusing. Or... Well, wait, okay, great. Wait, stick with me, okay? I can appreciate that comment because I haven't gone on to the rest of this. What does it say? To carry forward a work of physical and combined with the teaching of sanitariums will be established, and with these institutions are to be connected workers who will carry forward genuine medical missionary work. Thus, a guarding influence is thrown around those who come to the sanitariums for treatment. By the way, that's the hedge that Satan called it. And I quote this right here, made a hedge about him. Um, and the light was, and this is a statement from Ellen White, the light was first given to me. Why? institutions should be established. That is, sanitariums were to reform the medical practices of physicians. By the way, that is the statement that took me into medicine, took me back to school. I was a college dropout. I had about one uh, semester of credit. I started at 45 as a, as a second semester student in college. Going on, she says, the God of heaven is honored by an institution managed in this way, the blank sanitarium was established in the order of God that men and women might better understand the virtues of the tree of life. 
In his mercy, God has made the sanitarium such a power in the relief of physical suffering that thousands are drawn to it to be cured of their maladies. And very often, they're not only cured physically, but from the Savior, they receive the forgiveness of their sins and they identify themselves completely with Christ, with his interests, his honor. Their sins are taken away and placed in Christ's account. The healing balm is applied to the soul. They receive the grace of Christ and go forth to impart to others the light of truth. And can we realize how much God is glorified by this work? So this, what I'm doing here is showing us what does it mean that he's being robbed of his glory? Now, to get to your specific uh, point, I want to, uh, will be answered when I get to Second Selected Messages, page 346. This is my assertion. This is not a quote from Ellen White. Our College of Medical Evangelists has been transformed into a college of medical science. And I'm not saying that that medical science is, is bad or sinful. But as you will see, the counsel that we have about science is not, um, it, it's a warning. Anyway, continuing my words, instead of our sanitarians reforming the medical practice of physicians, our sanitarian practices have been reformed by the AMA and the Flexner Report. If you're not familiar with the Flexner Report, it was uh, Abraham Flexner was commissioned by the American Medical Association in the early 1900s to uh, visit all the medical schools in the country and he was a, a, a master educator and he was to uh, make recommendations for lifting the standard uh, of medicine in our country and the world and that was a great idea that was a great idea. But what happened as a result of that is that the Flexner Report became the blueprint for reforms required of all medical schools. And if you have read anything about uh, Dr. McGann, he spent years trying to keep Loma Linda adequately uh, certified to continue operation. He, he lamented in a personal letter that's in print, you can find uh, I believe it was like April 1937 or something, uh, that to a, a friend he lamented that he had sometimes wondered if he had, it had been worth it. He even used that expression. I wonder if it has been worth it. We have spent all this time and money and resources and look what little we have to show for it. Because by that time in the 30s, it was a rare place to find a sanitarium that was operated under the in the same way that the early sanitariums were. You, you, right, you're aware that before Battle Creek was lost in the struggle between the ministry and, the, and uh, Kellogg, and he was definitely off. By then, he was, he was off the track, and Ellen White was telling him this plainly. But at any rate, that, before that happened, Battle Creek was literally world famous. It was drawing people from all classes, every country, coming to Battle Creek Sanitarium. Now we can say, well, that was because of John Harvey Kellogg. Well, actually, John Harvey Kellogg's hand was guided by an angel during surgery. We have that clear testimony from Ellen White. So it, it's not Harvey Kellogg. I mean, he was a wonderful, intelligent, capable, committed man. And then from what we understand, shortly after the 1888, uh, conference in Minneapolis, he was reconverted or converted anew and, and, and so forth. But my friends, this is one of our key things we have to understand. The work is a not about the people that are doing it. It's not about the evangelist. It's about God working in our evangelist, in our work. That should be our goal, is to be, to have be in a situation, in a position, and in a relationship that God can freely work. So, I'm getting to this thing about the miracles. God is, God is definitely still going to be working miracles, but we're going to learn here in a minute. It's a little different way. Anyway, uh, so here I say, um, however, unfortunate as it is, here on the screen I've got my cursor moving, that we've largely lost sight of God's reform mission for our sanitarium-based medical missionary evangelism. By the way, it is sanitarium-based. The sanitariums could be family-style, they can be in a private home, but she still refers to them as sanitariums. It's sanitarium-based is how, uh, in my belief and understanding of the counsel we have, 
is that's the basis that we should be doing our medical evangelism upon. And so um, I've worked in a number of lifestyle centers that I would say are essentially a modern sanitarium. Um, I, the only one I know of that did any surgery, uh, I will have to admit, was only uh, at Wildwood. But um, I'm not certain that we have to have surgery in a sanitarium for it to be a sanitarium. I don't know. That'll be a, it'll be interesting. Once, once the church, once we get our thinking clear that we are deficient, that our gospel that we're preaching is incomplete, if we come to that conclusion, which I believe we will when we study this carefully, then we will start seeking with all our heart to figure out how to do it. And I'm comfortable with whatever the church comes to the conclusion and how best to do it. If we feel like we have to have surgery uh, OR in every sanitarium of any size, I don't oppose that because we know that surgery is not sinful. It has its place. But what I often find happens in this world is that the good, the good seems to exclude the best. Oftentimes we're doing what's good, but we're failing to do what's best. What we, it's like uh, one place she talks about, on what talks about precious truth versus precious truth. Have you read that statement? She talks about that the, the gospel of forgiveness of sin is precious truth, but we have been called specifically to present present truth. Present truth was like Noah preaching about the flood to come. Uh, it's about us preaching the final judgment to come. So going on here where I was, uh, that, that is dwarfed by this fact. Notice this quote here from Desire of Ages. She says, Had Adventists held fast their faith and followed on unitedly in the opening providence of God, the Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts, and Christ would have come ere this to receive his people. But the work was hindered, and the world was left in darkness. It was not the will of God that the coming of Christ should be thus delayed. Now, a century later, the world is a vast lazar house of chronic disease that need not exist if our sanitariums had endured, indeed reformed the medical practice of physicians as intended. Our, this is me, obviously, writing. Our unbelief has not only, quote, robbed God of his glory, but has unleashed a tsunami of chronic disease upon the world. Now, I know I don't want to, I don't want to go too far. I don't want to be extreme, but I want to tell you, I believe that the fact that the medical expenses in, of the U.S. being now approaching 23% of our gross domestic product is spent on health care. Maybe you're not aware of that statistic. It was, when I first got into this, it was 18 to 19%, and, and it's getting higher. We cannot afford that. If you were, if you imagine, if you as a family of four had to pay, to spend almost as much on health care as you have to spend on your rent or house payment, how could you, I mean, you can't make it and it's growing. So why? Well, there's another statistic that over 80% of the visits to doctors are for chronic diseases that are known to be preventable or reversible. Listen, that was the message that we were given. Our health message, if implemented, would change that dramatically. I mean, it's been proven in so many ways. Uh, Christian Health Care MediShare. Some of you may have heard of that. Christian Care, Christian Health, anyway, uh, CHM. That, um, and that's not Adventist. Uh, I'm not, I'm on being recorded. Let me just stop there. But anyway, the point is, they recognize this and they promote healthful practices and education, health education to those who are part of the their lives, we would say in insurance. I'm trying to remember what they call it. Anyway, um, they have a, you know, a Christian model and they try to avoid being seen as, a, as an insurance company because legally they are classified as, not as an insurance company. That's why they don't have to have the millions of dollars of reserves that, in, that an insurance company has to have. So going on. So is this, is this stretching the meaning of the text, maybe adding 
to the words of the, this book, because that's what some would say uh, about what we've, I've just said, that, that we're, I'm suggesting that we and our unbelief have unleashed this tsunami of chronic disease. Uh, and then the, notice this quote from evangelism. We may have to remain here in this world because of insubordination many more years, as did the children of Israel. But for Christ's sake, his people should not add sin to sin by charging God with the consequence of their own wrong course of action. So, so clearly, something's amiss. We have, in fact, um, there have been huge consequences to our lack of faith. And I guess what I'm trying to, to, to share is that Well, like another place, she says that few in thinking about the, our, our lack of faith, our disobedience, or whatever, the suffering in this world, fail to think about the suffering, the impact of that suffering on Christ. Christ who must observe and, 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 and allow and see this to happen. Have you ever thought about that statement where it says in Genesis that it repenteth God in his heart that he had made man in the earth. I, I mean, I don't know that I fully understand how divine beings have repentance or regret. I think, I, I think of it as more regret that he had. But anyway, clearly, when it says there that, that, that everything that entered into man's mind continually was evil, only evil, I cannot imagine the creator would not have felt pain at that. And she points out that the pain that God suffers is seldom thought of, but it's, it's a, a very real pain that this puts on God. So, uh, last paragraph on that page, have we not allowed the Kellogg Battle Creek deb debacle and the pursuit of medical recognition for our medical school to lead us away from our unique sanitarium-based medical missionary evangelism? I, I, I can tell you, I assure you it has. I had the personal experience of going to the College of Medical Evangelists by the time I got there, known as Loma Linda University School of Medicine, and seeking, how do you do medical evangelism to, in our modern world, in our modern church, and getting nowhere with no one knowing what to do there. All we know how to do is to practice medicine. And let me tell you a little, let me, let's see, we have until 11.45, is that, isn't that correct? Yeah. Uh, I started, I mean, you know, medical school, you're busy. <laughs> uh, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, they say it's like taking 35 credit hours, okay, uh, in, a, in a college, where they won't let you actually take more than 16 without special, special permission. Uh, so my sister, a younger sister, actually went through medical school before me, and she told me, well, it's like sitting in front of a fire hydrant, and you don't try to drink at all, you just try not to drown. So anyway, but in that environment of a lot to do, a lot of studies, I was committed to understanding medical evangelism. So I went down to the library, uh, the Ellen, uh, Ellen White Writings Library that they have at Loma Linda, and I did some studying and reading about, and I wanted to understand, how did we go from a, a, an institution to teach medical evangelists to an institution that is basically teaching medical doctors, medical scientists. Um, and, and what I found was very interesting. They started off at Loma Linda uh, uh, with a course only called Medical Evangelist. And then there were those who felt that they wanted to be licensed as, as physicians, and that's why Ellen White wrote the Council about And for those who feel the call to become recognized as, as regular licensed physicians, we should provide what, everything needed so they can do that. Okay? So for a while, Loma Linda literally had two tracks. You could take the course in medical evangelism, or you could take the course that was leading to medical licensure. And here's what uh, Parrott, uh, forget, let me think of his uh, name, but anyway, there's a, a student who went through there. Uh, his last name was Parrott, and he was, uh, so we've got some correspondence from him writing to someone. Anyway, what he said was that during his time there, in the early days at Loma Linda, they, the faculty began to encourage the med people in the medical evangelism tr track to transfer into the medical 
a licensure track because they were not that much difference, and it gave you much broader options for what you know you can do. Uh, rational, I'm not condemning it at all, very rational, but what the effect was, and I saw, I looked at the actual enrollment records, and what happened was, in the, in the beginning, the medical evangelists were up here and a few uh, in the medical course, and then within uh, just a few years, it flipped completely. The, the vast majority were taking the medical licensure course, and there were very few who were taking the medical evangelism course. And again, those records are public record. Uh, I don't have them with me at this moment. I didn't, that was extraneous comments I, I'm adding as I'm talking with you about this matter. I do have, uh, I can get it though. Anything that I say to you or mention, uh, I have in my files and can get it for you if you can't find it on your own. So anyway, uh, notice this other quote here. Yeah, it's just, uh, at the bottom of the page there. Our people are now being tested as to whether they will obtain their wisdom from Christ or seek to the God of Ekron. Let us determine that we shall not be tied by so much as a thread to the educational policies of those who do not discern the voice of God. I'm glad I wasn't in McGann's place. I don't, I, I don't covet, I wouldn't want to have that responsibility. He had a very challenging, but this statement right here tells us what they were dealing with. Just, I mean, I don't believe it was coincidence that Satan brought about a situation just as we were starting what was to be our, our premier training institution for medical evangelists, he brought about a situation that made it so that we were, tremendous pressure was put upon us in our training program to comply with worldly thinking, worldly ways. And, and, then, and she says plainly, and if you look at this in context deeper than I have time to share with you, you'll see she was specifically talking about this question going on at the leadership at Loma Linda, well, I'm sorry, College of Medical Evangelists that was at, at that time. And, and I don't have, again, don't have time to, to, to show you and prove it to you, uh, but I've read these things and I can sh assure you that John Burden wrote a letter to uh, the General Conference uh, Medical Director, Rubel. And he said, here's the four things that we see, four possibilities for how we can go forward. And what had happened just about that time, and that was why one of the options was this, but just about that time, the osteopathic profession had won a case in court that led uh, uh, California to open up the recognition of alternative, or different, different, not alternative, that has a different meaning today, different disciplines for medical licensure. And so the osteopaths had opened the door just then, and one of the options that they had, and they mentioned was, that we could try to pursue a recognition of hygienic medicine. But that was not the choice that the leadership in their wisdom, and I don't know that I would have made any different decision, I'm not criticizing, but what happened was, the decision was, if we don't achieve AMA recognition, it won't be worth a plug nickel. That was the quote actually from the letter. And so, that's the way we went. And uh, here we are. You know, <laughs> we, we're, in, we're told that we, there, we can learn from the mistakes of others or we can repeat them and learn from our own mistakes. And so when I see a mistake that has been made, it's not a criticism of that person. In fact, I might have made a worse mistake if I'd been in that spot, but it is foolishness not to benefit from it. And we ha we're on the wrong track. Whatever, however we got here, we're on the wrong track because like I thought Pastor Mike, Dr. Pastor Mike made a powerful statement. He said, so um, where are our sanitariums? And of course, as you may know, many people uh, casually think, well, we, they used to call our hospital sanitariums. Did you know that Ellen White spoke of the need for a hospital in Sydney and also a sanitarium? Well, actually, the hospital she was calling for was in uh, Kurnbong, uh, up near the, the school. 
uh, but she called for a sanitarium outside the outskirts of Sydney. And so my point is, she used the two terms. She distinguished, she did not equate a hospital and a sanitarium. You look in her writings, you'll see, she understood there to be a significant difference. And the hospital was for short-term acute care at that time, and sanitariums were for lifestyle change and health education. And, and that was our call. We were called to do sanitariums. Um, so, so the idea that, well, you know, all the hospitals really, that's our sanitarium. No, they're not. They're, that's not a, at all. Uh, in fact, when I was a, a medical student, I think I was still a student, much less a resident, one of the best, um, uh, well, they call them chiefs, um, in the hospital for the training, he was recognized for his remarkable knowledge and ability. The, he taught us, he says, when the, you go down to the ER to see a patient that the, they've called you that's going to need to be admitted, you should be thinking right now about discharge. What am I going to need to do for this patient to be able to discharge them because this is the most expensive setting for giving them care and it's not always the safest because, as you know, you can have nosocomial infections from the hospital, etc. Well, that was like a, I mean, that just kind of blew my mind. That was the last thing I would have thought about. I'm going to go down there and I'm going to see about admitting a patient and I'm going to be thinking now about discharging them. Uh, but I understood it, as, you know, as, as we went on through our journey. So what is that? I'm just offering that as a piece of evidence that that's not how a sanitarium works. When you admit someone in a sanitarium, you're thinking, how can I help them make a change? Remember the story about the lady quitting smoking? And they went to the, so they had a camp out in the basement of the church or wherever it was, I don't remember exactly, but he told just today. Uh, that was, what did they do? They befriended her so tightly that they caused a, uh, a ban, if you will. There was, you know, what did he say? The wording he used was uh, different, but anyway. A, a lifestyle program often is a respite from and it, it lets a person get away from things they want to get away from but have not been able to. And we help them, we surround them, we support them, we walk with them, we carry them sometimes. Uh, anyways, so yeah, we, I could prove it to you if you needed it, but I'm sure you don't. The plain evidence is that we as a church have adopted the methods of the world for our medical work. Uh, I wrote an essay when I was, a, I was on the faculty. I was an uh, a assistant uh, research professor at Loma Linda for five years on the staff. Now I'm an off-campus adjunct faculty. And I wrote a, uh, about this when I was there and could see it. And that is, if you go to a, the hospital down the road or a few miles away that's run by the state government, or you go to an Adventist hospital, the, the treatment you will receive is essentially the same. I'm not talking about the way the people treat you or the, whether they stop you know, on Sabbath. I'm talking about what your prescription and what your treatment plan, it's, it's essentially the same. And part of the reason for that is because that's what it requires to be accredited uh, as a hospital through the you know, uh, joint hospital acc accreditation. So, all right. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead here. You know some of this. We, it was already quoted this morning. Soon there'll be no work done in ministerial lines, but medical missionary work. Um, she says, I do want to read this one to you in the middle, right here. Um, it's from 9164. She says, it is because of the directions I have received from the Lord that I have the courage to stand among you and speak as I do, notwithstanding the way in which you may look at the medical missionary work. I wish to say that the medical missionary work is God's work. Take hold of the medical missionary work and it will give you access to the people. Their hearts will be touched as you minister to their necessities. As you relieve their sufferings, you will find opportunity to speak to them of the love of Jesus. Councils on Health 533, paragraph 3. It is the Lord's purpose that his method of healing without drugs shall be brought into prominence in every large city. So I am, that's my commitment. Uh, a friend of mine who I work with uh, and I appreciate greatly has said, we need to uh, form an organization called Doctors Without Drugs. And, uh, and I think he might be onto something. But the point is, uh, I not, and the fact I want to treat in every city without drugs doesn't mean that I believe every drug is sinful or every drug is of the devil. That's, that's, a, that's an extreme, that's not my position. But this is said plainly, and we, are, we haven't done this yet. 
And the reason is that when you, um, well, let me just ask you. Let's suppose that you have a friend or a family member that gets sick. They've had uh, trouble with some condition, and, it, and they start having some acute episodes. You end up in the hospital, and, uh, and you have prayer for them that they will be healed, and that God will get them back to health and home soon. And uh, in the hospital, they've got a brand new uh, treatment that has just been approved by the FDA. And then they apply this treatment, and the person has amazing improvements and results, and soon they're back home, uh, you know, none the worse for it. And we have a, a praise and thank you session for God. And what do we thank him for? We thank him for this amazing new treatment that God, you know, made available. And the skill of the team that used it and how got him well. And I'm not saying that there's not a time that that's right. But what is, what are we told? We're told that it's a mistake or it's, it's wrong, I think is the quote from Second Selected Messages 346, I think it's paragraph 5. But she says, it is wrong to ask God for a miracle while we neglect the simple remedies that he has provided. You see, we are to use simple remedies whether we use miracle drugs or not. And, but instead, what we often and most often do in the hospitals especially is... Uh, because they cannot bill for simple remedies. They can't bill for hydrotherapy. They can't bill for charcoal. Uh, and they're already having trouble keeping their finances together. Uh, so that's why we need a sanitarium. So are we not indeed preaching a form of godliness but denying the power thereof? The power of Christ's gospel was the physical healing he did that made it obvious he was from God, just as Nicodemus said, which we read earlier. The power of the gospel is our faith that works by love and purifies the soul. It is the evidence of loving obedience to every thus saith the Lord. Insubordination, on the other hand, is the denial of the power of the gospel. And as we read, so now unbelief separates the church from her divine helper. Her hold upon eternal realities is weak. By her lack of faith, God is disappointed and robbed of his glory. So there's a couple of uh, interesting statements here, and then I want to have prayers and have a, have a discussion. It um, took longer than I expected. He, Satan, leads deceived mortals to account for the works and miracles of Christ upon scientific principles. He makes them appear as the result of human skill and power. In many minds, he will thus eventually destroy all true faith in Christ as the Messiah, the Son of God. And then second selected messages... 346.3, God's miracles do not always bear the outward semblance of miracles. Often they are brought about in a way which looks like the natural course of events. When we pray for the sick, we also work for them. We answer our own prayers by using the remedies within our reach. Let me just pray and then we'd like to discuss what time we have left. Father in heaven, oh Lord, we are but clay, vessels of clay. But you are able to rise up an army out of bones, you are dry bones. You are able to raise us up to an army, terrible as an army with banners, that we could be your channel for doing what you want to do in this earth. It's, it's not up to us. It's not we individually, or we as a church, as a group of people. It's you working through us that will finish this work. And we want to be fit instruments for you in Jesus' name, amen. So yes, let's, uh, let's start with your question about the, about the miracles. So do you want to m m share a thought or? I've got a few things right now, I don't know if anybody else does. I know we don't have very Yeah, well I'm going to do this one first because you mentioned it, the one about, okay, the, so about miracles. Here's the thing, what else, as you were moving forward, yes. my name's Jennifer Yes. Okay, thank you Jennifer. Um, I'm and I'm from Virginia. I call them I call them raw miracles. Right. Okay. That, okay. All right. We'll call them that. But that's a good thing. I'll remember that. So the raw miracles, right? So they're not going to necessarily be differentiated with the way that Satan's going to be behaving as well. So there's going to be a commingling of some of that. At, you know that. Yes, and particularly at the end. Confusion and, and all that. So our job as medical pe missionary people is to provide them with the healthcare preventative medicine. Um, care medicine when they're already in a state of chronic illness, right? 
and then maybe even medicine pills, like we're saying, if in fact we're, sometimes it's necessary. I would agree with you. But I think my initial question was answered to get to your Yes. Thank you. And that, that our practice of medical missionary work is going to be the miracle. You know, the love that we provide and the care that we provide, that becomes the miracle as opposed to well, let, right? Yes, yes, yes. Let me ask you. So, are you in the medical field? I am a dietitian. But uh, okay. Well, well let's, I just wanted to. Well, the reason I asked that question is, and if anyone here who is in medical, let me just ask you this: If you were working in a normal medical setting, which would be a clinic or a hospital or whatever, and you did a blood test on someone who had chronic disease and their uh, cholesterol or something, some number was quite high. And a week later, you ran the same test on them, and it had dropped over 100 points. What would your first thought be? It would be, well, we need to repeat the test, because you're right. I mean, there's something went wrong here, so let's do another blood draw and see. I routinely see points of over 100 point drop in 8 to 14 days that, to me, is miraculous. Now, it's not a raw miracle, like uh, that statement, do not always appear or bear the outward semblance of miracles. So I had, we just recently had a lady, for example, non adventist went through a, a, an immersion program. We're doing what right now, something called 16 days, because we're making it so that it's only on the weekends that they're there all day, and in weekdays, they're there in the evening so that we can have people who work. Anyway, and this lady came, and, and she had a um, 271 point drop in her triglycerides. She had a 163-point drop in her blood sugar. She had a small drop, only 70-something, in her cholesterol. Uh, anyway, she went from gross uh, problems in her labs to practically everything normal. But when, when you talk to her about what happened and how excited she is, she doesn't tell you about, well, she will mention that, but what she's excited about is, I can drive again. I don't have to use my walker. All the pain in my legs has gone away, and I'm not getting awakened at night three and four times. I, I can feel my fingers. I, I can, they were numb. Now I can feel stuff. She, I'm go, she said just recently, she says, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw away my uh, handicapped parking permit. I don't need it anymore. Praise God. I mean, to me, that sounds like what happened. Yeah, it sounds like a miracle. And not only that, she is excited to understand more about the people who are doing these kind of programs. And then she spread the good news. And that's right, because she got another, you're exaggerated that she got another person who was wanting to be in the next one. Yeah, okay, yes ma'am. And to the, the faith in Jesus, that your faith, it's not just the natural remedies. God A said don't have faith in my natural Amen. remedies. Amen, amen. It's wonderful, and this is what right. I'm giving you. Right. But it's the faith in Jesus that we're trusting in him through the remedies. Absolutely, you said it perfectly. Yes, we do these natural remedies, and they are physiologically sound, but they cannot explain those kind of things that we just described. In fact, I, what I think, you see there's a synergy. I have seen people do hydrotherapy without any diet change. It's not nearly the same. The diet seems to potentiate the contrast baths and the things that we do. We use charcoal, simple stuff. You, yes, sir. I want to say this. Thank God for his word. We have a historic nation that God established through Abraham. Their history proceeded through eons of, of, the, of the gospel, you know, the Bible. Uh, it ended up in total chaos. They were broken, they were separated, they were put into exile. Uh, so I praise God that in studying his word, we follow a system of putting God more and more aside and allowing the, the heathen nations to influence us more and more. Uh, we have been subject to the same procedure, brother, from the time that the Adventist church was formed right up until today. Our leaders, our congregations are being drawn into a mentality that we think we can do it. What we do forget is that when Christ walked on this planet and he performed a miracle, 
It wasn't his claim that it was his healing. It was his the father. father. That's right. Let us never forget that we have the glory and the, the consecration, the blessing of the power of the Holy Spirit Amen. with us. Amen. If there is ever a miracle that is performed, I will never take the glory. Brother, I will give it to the God who performs the miracles. Amen. I will give it to our Savior. Let us draw into an attitude of intimacy with our Savior, with the Holy Spirit, and with our Heavenly Father, that these things that we talk about become secondary almost. Mm -hmm. But we implement them because we are driven by the force of the Godhead that we Amen. And, and that, yes, thank you. And, and I believe that that force that you're speaking of is a love He puts in our heart for others. I mean, I, I, I mean, you know, I've recently been feeling convicted. Uh, it's, uh, it, it hurts, but it's, um, I mean, I haven't, I haven't killed anybody, you know, even before, before I was a Christian. I didn't, I didn't shoot anybody. I didn't rob any banks, but I was a bad person. I was a sad, I was a sad case of humanity. Okay, so then I'm converted, and I've changed, and I, I called Porter for a year and a half, and I, and I did, all, you know, I've done wonderful works. So have I not cast out demons in your name? Depart from me, I never knew you. It's about knowing God to the extent that I truly don't care about my own self. I, I, want, I want more. I want to I care less about John Kelly and more for people that in my old life, which, and sometimes it happens in the, in my, since I've been converted and I repent of it, but uh, that I would just be offended. That's what a, you know, what a miserable case of humanity. I don't care to have anything to do with people like that. I am sorry, but maybe you are all Christians, you never had any of those. But I, I am recently realizing I got a whole nother realm of learning to love like Christ did. I mean, think about it. Christ healed people who he knew, we just read that early on, he knew had brought the sickness on themselves. They, it, they did not deserve in one sense to be delivered from it, but he loved them. He saw in them what they could be. And that's what I want to do. I want him to help me see, when I see cases of terrible abuse and drug abuse. I mean, we got, we got people doing terribly bad things everywhere in this society. I want to be able to see them as what Christ sees them, what they could be if we can help them connect with Christ. Yes, Jennifer. I just wanted to make a comment I read recently that you guys may appreciate. Um, it said, Ellen White, I don't remember where and I don't like to do that, but she said, uh, if our focus is to, get, to grow our relationship with Jesus Christ, and that's our focus, Everything else will fix itself. So, so what, what we're doing, what we're doing, and what I see, and I'm, this is not a criticism because I do it myself. I get the cart before the horse. I want to run around. And, you know, it's okay to be in the honeymoon phase. We all know that. Okay, but that's not sustaining, right? So when you get to know Christ to your point, and you get down into the granularity of who you are. And you start addressing your sanctification process, and, and you're not beating yourself up up every day either, because mm -hmm. that's not biblical. But anyway, and th that is your focus. The the other stuff kind of starts fleshing out. The, the murkiness in your life starts clearing right. itself out. It really yeah. does. And, but it's hard because we're not taught to be still, right? We're yes. not. Yeah. We're not taught yeah. to be still. Yeah. That is not a, a the nature of the human being, at least in our world. Yes. Yeah, the, the, the worldly thing is, for goodness sake, do something. But, but, for, but when we're serving God, it's like, uh, for God's sake, be still and know that I am God. Look at Elijah. When he was still, when Elijah was still here, and he became his servant, he literally was his servant. Yeah. When he would get his slippers for him, I mean, we're, we're all the way down to that before the mantle literally got yeah. passed on to him. Yes, right? yes. We forget that that's part of the process. Yeah. Before that, before the, you know, 
Yes. It, it helped me to know that because I, I'm, I'm kind of energetic and you know want to get involved and maybe it's not just calm down. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's easy. I believe it's. Uh, I believe there's a reason that the, he says, "Be not overcharged with surfeiting." Okay, in plain English, that means be not overcharged with the with the daily affairs of life, and 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 that is a danger. We definitely we can get so busy that we don't have time for God. And let us not forget, brother, that there's a statement here where Satan knew as much about Job as God knew. And Satan was going to do everything in his power to take this man out. So, when we are following a trend, we've got to subject that trend to the Word of God and make sure that we are in compliance with the direction that yes, He is yes. leading us and that we have nothing and I, I can tell you the devil knows everything about all of us. And he knows just which buttons to press. Sure, sure he does. And he will challenge God on those buttons. But praise God for the robe of Christ's righteousness. He took it off of Joshua. The angel took the robe, his dirty robe off and put yeah, on yeah, the yes. robe of yeah. Christ. Thank God. Amen. And that's where we must stand. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I know our time is, is almost up, not quite yet, but I just want to uh, recap by saying, so here's my, where I, if someone were to ask me, okay, what were you, were, you gave a talk, what was it about? So this is the little elevator speech, all right? But what I would say is that my study has led me to the uncomfortable position that we are not preaching the gospel that Christ taught. We have uh, changed it to where we are talking a lot more about the theory and uh, the things that happen in, in heaven that we're, you know, our sins are forgiven and, and we are, Christ is taking our sins away. You know, I was such a skeptic that when I became a Christian, I was in the process of becoming a Christian, I, and they were telling me that, you know, you're, Christ died for you. Your sins are forgiven. I says, well, can you, uh, can you give me some evidence? I mean, you know, if somebody says that I've been given a car, I want a title. If they said I've been given a house, I'd like to have a deed. I mean, is, and so, and I know you're going to, some of you are going to say, and you're, you will be partly right. Well, you, you have to take this stuff on faith. Well, but there is proof. There's proof. What is the proof? There is proof. Jesus said in Luke 5, and it's re recorded in the other Gospels. I just happen to like Luke's version. But he says, because remember, he said, Son, thy sins are forgiven thee to the paralytic. And the rabbis and the people stand, you know, the law, who are his spies, actually, they weren't there to, to learn from him. They were trying to find something to accuse him of. But anyway, they said in their hearts, oh, who can, this is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God? And so then he proves his divinity by reading their minds, and, but they don't mention that. But anyway, <laughs> says, why question you in your hearts? He says, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven you or to rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sin. He said unto the man with the palsy, rise up, take your bed, and go home. So Christ offered physical healing as the authentication for those of us who would like some proof. <laughs> and I believe with all my heart that we are robbing God of his glory we don't mean to but we're doing it by not including the evidence that your sins are forgiven I believe that that yes the thief on the cross, cross that was converted on the cross as best I can tell his soul was saved he never had any proof but I also believe that God offers evidence that the Son of God who died for our sins was God and that's the proof that I am forgiven, that it's real, not just something that, some story, some myth. Anyhow, uh, so anyway, my elevator speech, that was way too long. My elevator speech is <laughs> that, that we are not preaching the gospel that Christ preached and we need to and we're having a form of godliness 
while we deny the power. And again, I showed you the power was the miracle works, the things that he did. All right, so when people want to know, are you, how do I know you are the representatives of Christ instead of this group over here, they're doing, they claim to be Christians, they claim to be healing. In fact, I've seen them heal, do healing services. Where's your healing service? You mean Adventists are supposed to have a healing service? Yes, we are. Listen, we are to be the healing element for God in this. And what did it say? He desires to work through us as channels for his healing. Did, you, uh, did I show that statement? Uh, there's a wonderful statement. She says uh, that the, God's purpose for us in visiting the sick is not merely to comfort them, but to be channels for his working for the, their healing. Next time that you visit the sick, think about that. Ask for that. Pray for that. Uh, and I just reminded myself of something important. I have a handout here that you're welcome to. Uh, um, it's not for this particular class. It's called The Gospel and Medical Ministry. Let not man put asunder that which God hath joined together. And uh, this is a, a, a what, 18 page, uh, half page, well, Anyway, uh, you're welcome to take this if you would like one. Um, it's about 63% are of the words, because I did the arithmetic on this, are from the Bible or Spirit Prophecy quotes. Only about 37% are my thoughts expressed between them. But the point is it's a study on this very topic. I don't, I was not, when I wrote that a decade ago or so, I was not under the conviction I am now I didn't understand that the message of the true witness was calling us uh, to realize we're not preaching the gospel that Christ preached. I invite you, if that, that sounds almost too radical to believe, but I invite you to study it, ask God, is this true? Because here's the thing, if we find out that we are not preaching the gospel that Christ preached, what will be our natural immediate response I would say it would be reform it would be to repent to 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 do I mean all of us would agree we we if I'm preaching something other than the gospel that Christ preached then I'm in danger of actually working against him right there's only one true gospel so what my friends have told me says well John that's a little harsh I mean aren't we preaching some aren't we isn't what we're preaching true and I'm like Yes, I believe, for the most part, our doctrinal positions on the gospel are correct. But what we're preaching is by our actions, not by our words. Blessed is he who hears these words, but those who do them. So, in a sense, we are not. You see where I'm coming from? Think about it yourself. Well, anyway, we, um, it's, yeah, three minutes. Let's pray and ask God's special blessing on us. Father in heaven, we've been talking about uh, matters that are foundational and fundamental to the gospel work. And we know that we've been called as your remnant, the people of the Church of Laodicea, the time of the end, to present the gospel in its practical way to a world who is soon to be condemned. And how could you and your great love and mercy condemn a whole world without first giving them a demonstration, one final demonstration of your mercy, your willingness and readiness to forgive and to restore. And you want us, it is your call to us to be that demonstration. We are totally aware, filled with the consternation we cannot do this except we become a vessel for you except as we like Christ and like our brother said point each one to it's your work not us working but your work through us for them Lord this is our prayer this is our desire we we repent of where we have failed to to do this we want to ask forgiveness and more than that, victory. We want to be instruments that are clean, clear, and ready for you to work through to finish this sin experience that we can put it 
a way for eternity in the universe. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.